Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and it has not been long since we've talked about Elon Musk and his Starship Hopper, and, well, a lot has happened, so we've got to talk about it again, which is great if you're into that, and I love talking about it because, frankly, the idea of building a rocket in a field is utterly crazy and amazing, and I love it, and I hope it's successful. But yeah, uh, we are expecting engine firings off it. We actually were told that there might be engine firings today, but uh, it, it looks like it's been delayed a bit. So uh, about a week or so ago, a Raptor engine arrived at Boca Chica and it was installed into the test hopper. If you remember, the nose cone had blown over in a storm and they had it was expected that they were building a replacement. No, they're not building a replacement. Elon has confirmed that actually they are now building a second test vehicle, which will be bigger and better and possibly able to go even higher. For now, they're going to do test flights with the Starship Hopper using a single Raptor and adding another couple of Raptors later on. So the arrival of the Raptor did actually get us a good look at the engine because it arrived without any covering and there's been some great images. So I want to show you what we now know about the Raptors and how what we know about the fuel flow using the images we've seen. Okay, so what we have here is two images that I'm going to use to try and lay out the Raptor engine as I see it. I'm not a rocket scientist, but I play one on the internet. So the one on the left is from Elon Musk. It's not the greatest quality, but it shows one side of the engine. The engine Im image on the right shows the other side of the engine and was posted to Twitter by Chris from nasaspaceflight.com. I believe the original image was taken by Boca Chica Gal, who I know for a fact has been taking even better images, but I haven't got permission to share those, so I'm not going to use those. This is sufficient for my level of drawing quality to guide you through the engine. First thing to look at is the engine bell. So the engine bell is here, and you can actually see how it obviously constricts down to a throat and then starts expanding outwards. This is obviously a standard thing on rocket engines. You compress down the flow, and you get this kind of uh, this choked flow here is what they call it, and the, that improves the performance of the engine. Above this is the combustion chamber, and I think the top of the combustion chamber is going to be lined up with this pipe that's coming around here, and you can actually see the pipe on the left side as well. I think this is taking the output from the oxidizer, sorry, the fuel-rich pre-burner, uh, and it's mixing it here. So I think this area here, I'm going to find a suitable color. Let's make it yellow. This is where you're going to have your injectors that are going to mix your gaseous oxygen input and your gaseous methane input. So where's the oxygen coming from? The oxygen, I think, is probably coming through here. So this is going to be your O2 in. And this is going to be a whole structure here that's coaxial with the engine. It's going to include heat exchangers at the top. It's going to include the pre-burner. It's going to include the turbo pump. And then it's going to have a manifold where everything fixes. This is the worst drawing of a turbo pump ever. Don't worry. Now, the methane is actually coming in on this structure on the side here. And you can actually get a better idea of what might be in the, the center here. So this is going to be your CH4, because that is the symbol of methane. And again, this is where your, your kind of fuel or whatever is going to flow into the main engine. You're going to have heat exchangers, you're going to have turbo pumps, you're going to have pre-burners. This is also going to be used to cool the engine, and you can see these black pipes running around here that go into these pipes that ring the engine. See that? There's other ones in there. Now, what's going to happen is this is going to go into the walls of the engine bell, and it will flow down, it will flow back up, and it will keep the whole thing cool. I mean, it might only get down to there. I'm not sure exactly how far this goes down, but it will cover the whole um, combustion chamber to keep it from melting. There's a couple of other valves here, right? These look like return valves here. So we've got, these are two big ones. These are much smaller. And I think these are the gaseous return uh, pipes that are used to pressurize the fuel tanks. They boil 
a bit of methane and then it comes out this pipe. So this is CH4 again. And then they will boil a bit of their oxygen and it will also be returned to the tanks. And the idea is they push this gas back into the tanks and it makes sure the fuel is consistently flowing out of them. This is called autogenous pressurization as opposed to pressurizing the tanks on the Falcon 9 where they have a helium bottle and they just release the helium slowly to make sure that there's always pressure inside the tanks. Now, another thing to note is that there's a lot of wiring here, right? This is almost certainly just development hardware. I'm pretty sure that when the engine reaches its final version, a lot of this will disappear, but this is during development. They're collecting way more data than they would need to run the engine in production. And a lot of this stuff will be taken out when the Raptor becomes flight ready. I mean, obviously the simpler you make the engine, the more reusable, the more reliable it is going to be. So other information that has come out uh, from Elon is that the engine as developed is going to be able to throttle, probably down to 50%. He thinks that in theory it could go all the way down to 25%, but that would be tough. Throttling a rocket engine is actually really, really complicated, and it's even more complicated when you're dealing with a full-flow staged combustion cycle where every part of the engine depends on every other part of the engine at the same time. So changing something in one place affects everything else. More interestingly is the video that he posted showing the thermal protection system. Now these are sound like they are tiles very similar to those on the space shuttle. Uh, Starship has to be able to have a fast turnaround. That's the whole point of this. It can't use the Pika X or the Pika version 3 that they are now using because while that is a great thermal protection system, while it's very light and very good at protecting stuff, it's is not reusable. You have to take it off and replace it. So now we have these uh, hexagonal tiles which fit together very well and they will cover large parts of it, but transpiration cooling will still be needed in hot spots. I'm going to say one of the places you get hot spots is where you have some surface feature such as an edge or a tile or something, there you will actually get extra heating. So how they transition from the areas that are transpiration cooled to where the tiles start, that will require some careful engineering to minimize and make sure that there is no like ridges that are causing extra heat to happen. So yeah, I'm hoping that by the end of the week we will actually see some Raptor engine firings. I'm not sure when it will fly, but yeah, hey, it's about 10 days to April 1st, so you never know. <laughs> Maybe he'll fly on April 1st just to, you know, mess with people's heads. Yeah, um, over at NASA, we've seen some new images from the Demo Mission 1, including some really high-quality recovery images. And yeah, SpaceX nerds are looking at this in extreme detail, trying to figure out you know, the heat flows and the, the pressure and all that other stuff that I don't really know about too much. There was also a really good interview with Elon with, and uh, Jim Bridenstine, the administrator of NASA, who of course has been laying down the law as regards to SLS. But they talked on the crew access arm before demo mission one. And Elon got to tell his Russia story where, you know, he went to Russia to buy some missiles to launch something to Mars and they ended up wanting to charge him three times the price and he went home empty handed and decided to commit himself before that decade was out to launching a rocket into space and almost went bankrupt in the process. But now he's running a rather successful rocket company, which is pretty much, you know, pushing Roscosmos out of the commercial launch business. Anyway, yeah, despite the awful audio quality because of background noise, it's definitely worth listening to, especially if you're, say, down in South Texas waiting to see an engine test happen. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.